Hi, students. Uh, welcome to your uh, assignment today. And um, I hope that uh, when you are looking through this PowerPoint, uh, I'm hoping that there are opportunities for you to light up with learning. Hope you can see Mr. Pumpkin here. Mr. Pumpkin will be my motivation for um, today. And uh, one of the things we'll be talking about is the start of a lesson. And when you do start a lesson, it's important to have some type of motivation uh, or a way to get students interested. Uh, we also call that a, an anticipatory set to get students interested in what you're about to teach. So Mr. Pumpkin is serving that purpose in lighting up your learning for today. So we've talked about the importance of knowledge, the knowledge of content, and we talked about that you really can't teach what you do, do not know and uh, the different ways in which the knowledge of content not only helps students, but it also helps uh, the teacher or the person who's presenting. We talked about the importance of getting to know students uh, in many different ways to um, understand their developmental levels. And um, we had a slide that we spent quite a bit of time on in terms of uh, developmental knowledge, the emotional aspects of it, the affective uh, areas to consider, and also the physiology uh, aspect of the classroom, and to understand their stages of uh, development. And uh, we've also spent some time talking about the four instructional approaches that you can use. And I'm hoping that you recall or remember those four. Um, do you? And um, uh, so now we're going down to the second piece of our um, PowerPoint, which is the idea of uh, skills. And <clears throat> this is really uh, related to, to how uh, teaching occurs. So this is knowledge relates to what you teach. Again, we talked about standards and uh, the, these three aspects here. And now we're talking about um, uh, how you teach. So what you teach and how you teach. And let's go to our next slide. So one of the ways that we can capture how one teaches is, is through something called the pedagogical cycle or pedagogical cycle. And this is just a framework that you can use that, that really illustrates the, the teaching uh, learning process or the teaching cycle, all right? So the first part of the cycle starts with um, uh, the structure, or um, I would call it the lesson plan. And we've spent a few minutes on this uh, on Monday. But um, when you look at a lesson plan, you would consider these aspects of um, the lesson. Now, they're, they're a little bit different than what is on a handout that I shared with you on Monday. But uh, there's also a lot of similarities. So when you're getting ready to plan a lesson, you want to look at, your first of all, your standard. You know that from the knowledge piece that we've talked about. You want to know from the standard what objectives are you trying to accomplish for your lesson. You want to make sure that you incorporate a review. We talked about how the brain likes to have information that is has heard before. And the more information you can uh, relate to the brain uh, uh, relative to past learning, the better you'll have a chance of remembering or taking that information and storing it from short-term to long-term uh, memory. We've talked about the idea of having motivation. That's where um, Mr. Pumpkin came in and uh, hopefully lighting up your knowledge for today. We talked about having some type of transition or actually, we haven't talked about transition, but I want to share that with you. So you want to figure out a way to move from this information to the actual content that you're delivering. And so movement from one part of a lesson to another <clears throat> is an important word is called a transition. So transitions can occur physically, and they also can, occur as for example, students getting up and moving from one center to another center, or moving from... Um, the classroom to recess, but transitions can also occur within a lesson. So we want to move from the beginning of the lesson 
to the middle part of the lesson where we're delivering our uh, our content and so if you see this blue here delivery of content this is where we want to uh, chunk our information put it in a way where students can um, uh, understand it we talked about this as part of the design quality you want to also provide examples when you're giving new information and you want to scaffold that as well now scaffolding means that if a student doesn't understand it we sort of back down a little bit and we try to build that understanding back up until they until they get it so these are all things these three uh, actually four or no, three are um, ideas that we use when we're delivering content and then as you move towards the end of your lesson you want to think about <clears throat> how are you going to close it off are you going to have a practice activity if it's directed instruction then you could have a guided practice or independent practice are you going to have homework are you going to have a ticket out the door where students reflect uh, or are you going to talk about what they're going to be doing in the next day and perhaps even provide some sense of motivation for coming back to, to learn uh, um, in, the, in the next lesson, right? So <clears throat> these components, the components of structure, uh, these two sides here, element and key ideas, these really relate to what you would build into a lesson plan, into a design of a lesson. Then as you're in the lesson, you're going to use questioning, right? Uh, low order questions, we've talked about that that will build up the knowledge base high order thinking the why and how types of questions that is going to deepen the students thought processes and deepen the um, um, the thinking that goes on but you need both you need low and high order questions to kind of make it work um, And then we go down to when you ask a question, you're going to get a response. And one of the key ideas of re, uh, in the area of response is the, um, is the concept of wait time, that before you call on somebody, you wait three to five seconds. And that um, provides students that may not be as, um, uh, may not be able to generate a response as quickly, that gives them time to respond. And it also uh, ensures that you have a better quality response when people have time to think about what they, what they want to say or what they could say. So there's many advantages to using the wait time. And then, so you ask a question, you provide feedback or respond to the student, and then you can provide feedback. And there's generally four types of ways you can provide feedback. You can provide praise, and praise can be general praise like good job, or it could be specific praise where you're actually uh, praising the response of the student to indicate that something was learned. Um, I think we did some examples of that in class. Um, I like the way uh, Johnny or Mary, I like the way that um, you uh, were able to use the distrib distributive property when you solve that problem, you were able to blah, 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 blah. So basically you are sharing with the student uh, what they did, you're reinforcing that, providing specific praise, and you're also alerting students or um, letting students know that this is the way the problem was solved. So in your response, you're actually teaching. Again, you're actually reinforcing. And again, we said the brain likes that. You could do acceptance, a nod, yes, uh, you did a good job. You could also do remediation. A remediation is a fancy term for if a student doesn't get the problem correct, then um, uh, you uh, scaffold or you um, provide feedback that helps the students reach that particular um, answer. So um, you kind of step back, a scaffold, ask other questions that help lead that student to answer the question correctly. You also can use criticism as well, constructive criticism, but you have to be very careful about how you, how you use that. Sometimes that can hurt the affect, remember that term, the affect of a student, and uh, you have to know your students, you have to know uh, what level their self-esteem is uh, at, and you have to make sure that you don't violate that self-esteem when you are using criticism. So that pedagogical cycle is just a very quick way 
of um, looking at how we plan and how we deliver instruction, instruction in a very basic way through questioning, uh, response, and feedback. This occurs all the time. It occurs in classes, especially occurs, occurs in our class uh, when we're having a question and answer uh, session. So um, the um, area that we talked about was the lesson plan. And so what I would like you to do is uh, take out the uh, lesson plan template that I gave you uh, on Monday, that very basic plan that talks about the components of the lesson and what they are. Okay, now we are talking about um, lesson plan. Um, and again, lesson plans really help us uh, to, to think about um, what the lesson will turn into. If you remember several weeks ago, we talked about the fact that all things are created twice. Uh, one is mentally, and then one is physically. So when we talk about lesson plans, we're really thinking about the mental creation of what we want to teach and what we want students to learn or do. And then the actual instruction becomes the, um, the physical creation or the do part of it. So the first thing that we think about when we're looking at lesson plans, and you should be using uh, or you should be looking at the lesson plan template that I shared with you. Um, there's actually two templates. I shared one with you on Monday, and that is just the basic core uh, um, ideas of what a lesson plan looks like. And then on Wednesday when you came to class, I shared with you an example, uh, a, a sample lesson plan. So we're just looking at the basic core template. Uh, but you have your objectives, which you start with your state standards, and then you work uh, towards your objectives in terms of what you want students to know or be able to do. And then remember we talked about the fact that we also want students to be able to understand what we're teaching. And so that's where the idea of academic language comes into play. We want students to be able to uh, understand the vocabulary uh, that we're using. We want them to understand the terminology. We want them to be able to use the um, vocabulary or the language that we are um, sharing. So it's just not enough to recognize the words, it's important for them to be able to actually apply uh, the academic language. And then we bring in this idea of evaluation or assessment, and we do that early on. Uh, a lot of people think, well, you think about assessment at the very end of your lesson. Well, you may assess at the end of the lesson, but you really think about assessment at the very beginning when you're designing your objectives and thinking about your academic language. How are you going to know whether the students accomplished your objectives? How are you going to know they are able to do what you set out for them to be able to do? So we think about the assessment and we can think about it in terms of formative assessment. So form means we're actually forming. Uh, formative means an, um, initial assessments. So we want to, um, uh, we want to get a, a sense for uh, if, if we are teaching a concept and uh, uh, we want to understand if students understand the steps in a, in a concept or in a process or a procedure, we're going to do little assessments along the way to make sure that uh, students understand. And then we'll do a big assessment at the end. So formative means um, as we're forming the knowledge, we want to do quick assessments. So uh, assessments like thumbs up or thumbs down or ticket out the door or uh, a homework or a quick quiz, uh, all of those things would fall under the area of formative assessment. And then summative assessment, so the word sum means putting it all together, uh, the sum of their learning, we would do at the end. It might be a unit test, uh, it might be a project that they're doing. Um, your Usually your uh, state assessments that you took when you were in middle school or high school, those would be uh, summative in nature. So remember those terms, formative, you, as students are forming their knowledge we're assessing, and summative is at the very end or the sum of their uh, uh, knowledge gain. And then um, 
the fun part is to think about, okay, what do I need? What materials do I need for this lesson? So this is the planning piece. And if you look at the other um, uh, template that I gave you, this is the actual uh, action piece, all right? So this is actually putting the lesson plan in motion. It's the physical creation. So this is where we have the motivation. We have the anticipatory set. In other words, we're creating anticipation among the students uh, for their upcoming learning. We want to get them interested in what we're about to teach them. So it could be a review. It could be a story, it could be an object that we share, but just something that sort of captures their uh, interest before we move into the body of the lesson. And then uh, we have the body of the lesson. Again, much of the body of the lesson is gonna be in content that's delivered or questions that are asked and, and feedback. Um, we might, this is where we look at the visual the auditory, the kinesthetic aspect of involving students in the lesson. So this is a critical piece. Um, and when people think of teaching, they often think of this aspect of um, action, and that is the body of the lesson. Many things can be done, connecting to emotion, keeping the brain research in mind, uh, all of those things that engage students occur in this section. And then we have closure. You know, again, how are we going to end that lesson? If we go back to the pedagogical cycle, we could think about reviews. Um, we could think about uh, some type of assessment. We can think about a preview for the next, for the upcoming day. Uh, we can look at students writing a summary. There's all kinds of ways to, uh, to end the lesson differently than just saying, okay, we're done today. Uh, we're gonna pick up tomorrow. You wanna allow at least five minutes or so where, where students can debrief and you can kind of check to see whether or not they have that understanding. And then the last piece, uh, could, which could be part of your closure, could be the reflection. And this could be two parts. This could be reflection on the part of the student. It also can be reflection on the part of the teacher in terms of what went well, what could I have done differently. Um, so what's in a lesson plan? I would like you to to now take a look at that other uh, template that I gave you that, that is an actual lesson plan. And just sort of look through that plan and look at the various components that we read or that we looked at in the previous two slides. Um, actually, um, this slide and this slide. Sorry, this slide and this slide. and see if you can see the different uh, lesson plan aspects and um, see if you can make connections between the various parts of a lesson plan. Again, all of this involves skills. It's skill in planning, it's skills in teaching, and it's skills in being able to assess and skills in being able to reflect. Okay, so in our last uh, piece, we've talked about knowledge We've talked about skills using the pedagogical cycle and a lesson plan as a basis for understanding the skills teachers need to use. Now the last piece that you are familiar with because we had our conference, and these are dispositions. So these are dispositions that um, teachers have that uh, make them effective in their instruction. And we were gonna, we're gonna do more with dispositions when we talk about ethics in the next theme. But you can see some examples of dispositions are whether or not teachers care, whether they listen, um, whether teachers assume responsibility, whether they have empathy. A lot of the design qualities and the seven C's that we talked about incorporate uh, dispositions or qualities or behaviors that defines uh, a person's um, attitude, values, all right? So, if you think back uh, in terms of the teaching framework, knowledge, skills, and dispositions, would you be able to, to really explain this framework uh, to someone? Could you take apart the pieces of this framework? So this becomes the third model that, that you've been exposed to. First model, design qualities. The second model, the seven C's. 
and this teaching framework becomes the third uh, basic model for um, defining pedagogy or defining effective instruction. And there's the rubric, uh, the YHC professional dispositions that I that you self-assessed yourself just uh, on a couple uh, on in in a, a few weeks back, and those are some sample dispositions that we look for in our teacher candidates. Okay, and that's an activity that we're going to do at another time, so we'll skip that. And now we're going to go to the last. This is the fourth framework. It's the art and science of teaching by Bob Marzano. You'll see that there is another piece here called differentiation. I don't consider that part of the framework, but I think it's important to understand differentiation when you're looking at the three models. I also don't have seven C's here, um, and so I would sort of lump seven C's in with the design qualities, but we actually have four models now. Design qualities, seven C's, framework for teaching, art and science of teaching. So this is a picture of Bob Marzano, and this is a book. Uh, he's written many, many books. If you type his name into a browser, you're going to see uh, many books that he has done. And uh, he's quite, quite prolific in terms of his research relative to best instructional uh, practices. So one of the reasons why we um, study Bob Marzano or we bring him uh, to mind in our class is because the strategies that he suggests to, um, to us or to teachers are based on research. In other words, he, looks, he has looked back over many, many research uh, trials, many, many research papers that have been done, and um, he puts all of the research together. And what he has done is from all his work, he has distilled what strategies, if you use them appropriately, if you use them with what we call fidelity, in other words, you use them in a way they're intended to be used, um, you'll result in, students will result in uh, achievement gains. And it's too complex for me to share with you on this um, PowerPoint, but I can briefly share with you this slide. So he, based on his research, if you look at the left-hand side and you look under categories, um, you will see that if you use activities that, ident that have students identify similarities and differences, whether they're reading something and then taking that information and mapping it out uh, um, using a, uh, uh, a word web or using a graphic organizer or just chunking the different classifying like you did with the t-chart the different um, uh, similarities and differences that students will achieve a 45 percent tile gain over those students who haven't used a similarities identifying similarities and differences um, teaching strategy all right so uh, he's quantified the fact that this is a very high leverage strategy. It's a strategy that will really help students gain in their learning if, if you use, uh, use it. If you reinforce an, uh, effort and you provide recognition, in other words, if you use specific praise uh, and you uh, share with a student and, who's in a class with, and with other students why an effort was um, uh, uh, important, why uh, an answer was achieved, why a student got to a certain conclusion. If you make those uh, ideas visible to students so that they can recognize them, then you can achieve a 29% gain. In a, students can receive a 29% gain in student achievement as opposed to a teacher who doesn't use that strategy. Look at this. If you use homework and practice, again, we talked about the fact that the brain likes uh, practice. 28% uh, tile gain. And if you use non-linguistic representations, in other words, if students draw maps, pictures, uh, graphic organizers, um, some of the things that we do in our class, if they can represent the knowledge that you're teaching, then there is a 27% tile gain. So um, Marzano's book is uh, loaded with uh, strategies 
that uh, can work and increase in student achievement if, again, they're used with uh, fidelity. Okay, now we talked about the word chunking. This is what I mean by chunking. This is a big cat, and we call him Pumpkin Chunkin'. Say hi to the students. No? You say hi? Mm? All right. That's your lesson for today. Ugh. Some of you have heard me talk about Big Head, and that's that was Big Head there. Another way to kind of motivate you. Um, my assumption is Big Head has a big brain, but he's a very loving cat. Okay, the question that I have up on the screen, um, is this a compelling why, um, is, is being able to increase the achievement of your students in terms of learning and percentile gain on standardized tests, is that a, is that a good enough reason to um, use uh, Marzano strategies or strategies uh, that he has suggested. So that's a question that I wanted to pose for you. Now I'd like you to take this teacher evaluation model. This is going to be difficult to explain um, online, but I just sort of want to make you familiar with it. And uh, hope when we come back to class, we'll take a few minutes to kind of go over this. Again, our fourth model. So what Marzano has done is he has said these are the the moves or these are the uh, strategies these are the approaches that teachers should consider uh, when in teaching a classroom and each one of these is really research-based he's saying that if the teacher if a teacher does these kinds of things in their teaching that there's a good opportunity, a good chance that their students will achieve. So I'm looking at uh, the, these areas here. He calls them um, DQs or design um, questions. And each one of these is a segment. So we have a segment here. This is called routine events, things that occur naturally day in and day out. This is related to pedagogy or actual instruction. This is how we address content. And then these are things that are enacted on the spot. This lesson segment has to do with doing things as we're teaching, all right? Doing things in the moment, all right? So let's just take a look at, at this side over here. And I've got my map, so I'm looking at it because it has larger print. So DQ1 has to do with communicating learning goals. And what Marzano is saying is that the students understand the learning goal and they can assess themselves, which has to do with number two, students understand their current status on a scale. So if students understand the learning goal and they can ass assess themselves based on that learning goal, in other words, if you provide them with a rubric or you provide them with a means for them to see where they are relative to what you think they should teach or know, then their achievement will increase, okay? And if students feel, number three, if they feel pride and you as a teacher celebrate their success, then achievement will go up. So those are three things that are routine that should be practiced in the classroom. You provide clear, clear learning goals. It's very similar to um, design quality, clear standards. You provide students with opportunities to assess themselves or to know where they are relative. You give them feedback, all right? So they know where they are relative to that goal. And then number three, uh, as a teacher, you celebrate their success. The second piece really has to do down here, DQ, six, and you'll see the order, and you'll see how, why this is DQ six in just a minute and not DQ two, is that um, this has to do with establishing rules. So students can't learn unless you have a learning environment that's suitable and appropriate. 
So students know there's uh, a teacher has established classroom rules and routines. And you have those in place and they're being followed. It's going to increase the student's opportunity to learn. And um, you organize the physical environment. Now we talked about the, the idea of phys physiology. So in number five, right? Under DQ6, if you create that environment that's conducive to their needs, again, learning will go up. Now we move into the area of instruction over here, addressing content. So DQ2 has to do with helping students interact with new knowledge. So you can read the things here that teachers should do or can do to help students interact with new knowledge. So this would be knowledge when you're just introducing this information. Okay, so when I shared with you the different approaches to uh, the four approaches to instruction, I did a lot of questioning, I did a lot of interaction, uh, I gave you opportunities within your new group to kind of digest some of that information. So I was really working, when I introduced that information, I was really working from this um, DQ2 um, segment or this DQ2 part. So um, letting students know why, uh, what is important and not important, uh, using students to, to work in small groups to interact with the knowledge, that will help student achievement. Having students link what they used to know to previous, to, uh, having students link new learning to previous learning to make those links, make those connections. I stress that a lot in our class. That's important. Uh, chunking information. Number nine is really critical, will help students achieve. Um, students uh, are cognitively engaged with new content during interactions with other students. Again, uh, working in groups, uh, heterogeneous groups preferably. Um, helping students to draw conclusions from information that has been chunked. Um, helping students to record and represent their knowledge, you know, drawing the knowledge out, creating graphic organizers, those kinds of things to help uh, them remember is important. And um, uh, help students to be able to um, reflect on their own learning and to share out uh, with the teacher or to feel open enough to share with the teacher when they're confused that they don't understand. So those are real basic things that, that um, we, we do. And if you do those kinds of things, you don't have to do them every single day. You don't have to do every single one of those. But if you keep those in mind, that will help students uh, better remember information that's just reduced or just introduced. Now, you also want students to be able to uh, practice and deepen their knowledge. You want to take it beyond DQ2. So DQ3, there are strategies that um, I would like you to take a minute when this PowerPoint is over. I would like you to look over those strategies and um, to help deepen um, the knowledge level. So reviewing content, um, providing students with ongoing practice will help deepen using homework, examining similarities and differences, um, examining errors in their responses. So getting students to actually analyze their mistakes will be important. Practicing skills and revising their knowledge once they understood where their mistakes are. Those are all things that are designed to take students deeper. I would throw in also higher order questions. And then to help students generate and test hypotheses, um, this is the probably the ultimate uh, form of uh, thinking where students actually create or they hop, uh, hypothesize or they're uh, thinking at much higher, uh, higher levels um, than what we see in DQ2 and DQ3. So if I were to ask you uh, to create your own uh, teacher evaluation model based on the information that you've gained in this class so far, that would be uh, indicative of a DQ4 uh, type of activity where you're actually making something, generating a hypothesis, and then we would be looking at your um, 
your evaluation model, and then as a class, we would assess it. Uh, that would get us into the DQ4 uh, area. So DQ5, we've talked about that a lot. Um, this is actually engaging students, and you do these things. You don't plan for them. Actually, you just do them on the spot. You've seen me do this many, many times in the classroom. If you're tired, or if it's hot, or if I see you yawning, the 8 o'clock class group, uh, you know that there are things that I'll do right on the spot. I haven't planned, haven't thought about them, but there are things to do to get students engaged. So um, um, uh, noticing students who aren't engaged, using academic games, managing my response rate. Sometimes I'll ask things very quickly. Sometimes I'll slow things down. Getting you up and moving around, keeping, trying to keep a lively uh, pace. Um, using intensity and enthusiasm, uh, using friendly controversy. Uh, usually when I step out, when I say, Dr. Bruner's uh, out of the room, this is an opportunity for you to kind of talk and share. Sometimes you disagree, that's friendly controversy. Providing opportunities for students to talk about um, themselves, and when you do your observations, I bring that in. And then presenting unusual or intriguing information. So sometimes I'll just stop and I'll tell you, uh, 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 maybe a funny story or I'll share something that might be a little off the wall, but that is to kind of get you back engaged, all right? So all of those things I do, just boom, on the spur of the moment, you will do those as a teacher. This is, to me, the art side of teaching. Then um, the next uh, three, DQ7, is recognizing adherence to rules and procedures. Again, very similar to DQ6. But this is making sure that this is, you see the word withedness there. You make sure that there's consequences for students' actions. And you um, make sure that students adhere to the rules and the procedures. So you have to have that in place. So sometimes you'll see a student that has their cell phone out or they're doing something that's not appropriate. So you want to address it right away. You don't want it to ripple through the classroom. So this is where that DQ7 comes in. And then DQ8, establishing and maintaining effective relationships with students. This is um, where you have that rapport with them, where they trust you. You create that environment that, that, um, uh, where they want to be. You uh, accept uh, all students, not just those who can give you the answers. And then the last DQ9 is that communication high expectations for all students. So you're not just calling on the students. Uh, that are your high students, you're bringing along all students, especially those who may be having difficulty, okay? So this is the fourth model. This is pretty complex, uh, but I would strongly encourage you to bring this evaluation model to one of your observations and just basically kind of use this to st as a lens in which to see uh, how teaching is occurring. And this is a little video um, by Mar Bob Marzano. I would encourage you to take a, a look at this. Uh, he's talking about uh, the uh, assessment and the importance assessment. So I think you would enjoy it. It's about a three or four minute video, but I think you would hear, hear his voice, enjoy hearing his voice, and I think you would enjoy the message that he has to share. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. Um, I think 38 minutes is long enough. And um, what we'll do when we come back together uh, as a class, I'll take you very, very quickly through this diversity piece. It'll take us about 10 minutes. Uh, I would encourage you to kind of look through the rest of this video just to, sort, just to get a sense for what the diversity uh, segment is about. Um, there's also, I believe, um, Some questions here, for example, this one. Could you respond to what effective teaching is based on knowledge, skills, and dispositions? Uh, number four, does your definition touch on, touch on knowing and meeting all needs of students? Does your definition touch on engaging students? So uh, this is a really good question. I anticipate that I will be asking this question on a future commentary. So uh, I would uh, take some time to really think about whether or not you truly understand the aspects of knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And um, 
and whether you can connect these to this idea of effective uh, pedagogy. Could you write about that? Um, there is um, a couple sample test questions that you can take a look. Had we been doing a true and false type of quest or a, uh, a um, multiple choice type of quest, uh, test, these would be the types of questions that I would uh, ask. So you can take a look at those. All right, and we'll stop there with differentiation. Um, I do want you to pay attention to uh, the name of this lady, Carol Tomlinson. And um, uh, again, we'll just take a, probably about five or 10 minutes and talk a little bit about uh, the importance of differentiation, what that means, how that relates to the art and science of teaching. And, um, but by now, you've been exposed to four models, right? Can you repeat them with me? Um, the first model, again, design qualities. The second model, seven Cs. The third model, the teaching framework. And then the fourth model that we worked with is uh, Marzano. So thank you for paying attention. I hope this helps you. It moves us forward as a class and it gets us ready for the next theme, which is going to have to do with, I think you'll be very interested in this, which has to do with uh, ethics, and this will also move us into seven habits, which will give you an opportunity to get into some type of text and us an opportunity to really talk about what's in Covey's work. So thank you.